Welcome to Yokai Business Show, where we bring you the world's top business thought leaders to share their secrets to success, from leadership development to finance, marketing, self-development, human resource management, and much, much more. Our guests reveal the strategies, tactics, and mindsets that have made them so successful. So let's dive in and learn from the best in business. Hello and welcome back to another great show here today. Look, I'm excited about you being here because what we're about to talk about today is something that I truly believe in. I do this stuff and I also teach my students to do exactly the same thing. And it is about collaboration. Many of you know about our book, Eight Qualities for Great Leadership. And you already know that if we collaborated with other people. In fact, these eight authors uh, that are in that book. And the reason we put together eight authors in that is because we know the power of collaboration. It wasn't until I created that book with my colleagues that this whole power of collaboration became really, really evident. I don't think I would be doing anything else without considering partnering with other people. Therefore, we brought in an expert to talk about the power of collaboration. And that is my good friend here all the way from the US, Chuck. In fact, it is Charles uh, Kneibusch, uh, commonly known as Chuck, joining me for the very first time. Chuck, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, UK. Yeah. It's such a great joy to have you on the show. We were talking earlier on about the power of collaboration, and I hope uh, some of the points you were bringing to me, you will share with everybody here today. Uh, but before we jump on to talk about the power of collaboration and how to do collaboration well, and how to ensure that others win, you know, collaboration is about creating a win, 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 win situation. Before we jump on to all that, uh, Chuck, I know you were in the military, but I know you've done quite a few things. Would you let uh, our audience here get to know you a little bit? Yeah, I, uh, I joined the military when I was uh, 20 years old. And it was because I tried to go to college and I was not ready for college when I went. Kind of like we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, the student finds a teacher when it's time. Well, that was not my time. I needed some self-discipline. So I said, well, since college was not working or university was not working for me, let's go ahead and join the military. And I spent seven years active duty in the U.S. Army, two years in, in our National Guard. And by that time, I had, a, I had uh, gotten my associate's degree, so I knew it was time to kind of settle down. So I left the military and I went out into the civilian world and spent 28 years with a uh, major international uh, multi-billion manufacturer a furniture named Lazy Boy Incorporated. Uh, re retired from them about five years ago. And about a, a year after that, they asked me to come back. I did some consulting with them for a couple of years, um, wrote my book, and now I'm just kind of out there semi-retired helping people. Yes. What I love about your story is uh, you learn the principles of collaboration right in those early years in the military. Would you share with everybody some of the things that triggered you to want to harness the power of collaboration? Well, there's a lot of things in the military you kind of have to do on your own. But I mean, even from basic training, you know, you're not going to go ahead and make it through by yourself. That's right. uh, I mean, you have others who are showing you how to how to go ahead and set things up. You need to have others help you making sure your dress uniform looks just so. When you know, I was in communication and we go out to the field, we went out in teams of six, three people worked very closely on the switchboard, three people worked very closely on the radio. So again, I mean, that was the only way you could go ahead and cover multiple shifts. So it, it collaboration kind of was burned into my psyche from a very early point. And we didn't succeed unless we were all working together for whatever the common goal was. Yeah, it is amazing. There is a parallel to that. In business, you know, what I've discovered is uh, when you try to go solo, it is going to be, well, a little bit difficult. There is a saying that if you want to go faster, go alone. If you want to go further, 
go with others. And many people listening here, they want to go further. And that's, I want to go further. Uh, and what I have discovered that is when you start operating on your, you know, by yourself, there is, you, you're just one individual and you've got to be excellent in all business areas uh, for you to really make a mark. And if you are working 15, uh, 18 hours, oftentimes it's because you're going, it's solo. But when you begin to trust others to take care of certain aspect of your business, uh, it is amazing how much you can achieve. I like to give an example of the book that, you know, uh, that we wrote together. If it wasn't because of all people working together, really and truly, uh, we wouldn't be able to reach out the amount of people we are reaching and making such a huge difference uh, as well. Uh, talk to us, uh, Chuck. Uh, you have seen collaboration done well. Uh, would you share maybe one example of uh, the effect of collaboration, maybe in your civilian time uh, or even back in the military time? I mean, we had, I mean, most people don't have this, but I mean, to me, it's a great example of how collaboration really, really works and the power of it. We had a tornado that was spun off of a hurricane, hit the plant that I was the production manager over. Um, I mean, it caved in the roof. We had water. Uh, everything was a uh, machine operated. We cut wood parts for the rest of the company. We were the only ones who did that. Well, we had about we employed about two hundred people, and realistically, with that tornado hitting, there was no chance that anyone was going to be going to work come Monday morning. So, we had all of our employees who were going to be out of work. We had it was going to affect all the the ten plants that we serviced at the time. So we said, hang on, let, let's go ahead and put together a team. Give us a couple of days. We'll figure a way out of this. So, yes, I was kind of the leader of the team, but I don't know everything. Don't pretend to know everything. You know, so we had a scheduler. We had an accountant. We had somebody uh, who worked with our suppliers. Um, we worked with other companies in the area who also cut wood. And we basically rented their facilities for our people and put our people there in off hours. So, I mean, so, I mean the, collaboration the collaboration of working, not just within our company and creating a team to come up with this plan, but collaborating also with competitors, collaborating with competition and other suppliers to go ahead and say, hey, we need to redirect the raw materials here or there. Collaborating with our employees, because again, they weren't driving just maybe their 10 or 15 or 30 minutes to work. Sometimes we were sending them 500 miles away for two weeks at a time. So without every group working together, there is no way we could have successfully gotten our company through, you know, that six month problem until our plant was rebuilt. And it was really important that everybody played the role and everybody communicated when we, when we did find obstacles and we went ahead and said, Hey, this, we set the expectations early. We said, things aren't going to be perfect. We know that. But we'll go ahead and overcome every obstacle as we find them or as we anticipate them by working together. And the communication was absolutely key to that collaboration. I'm glad you brought the aspect of communication because it leads naturally into what I want to talk about uh, as to what uh, makes up a great collaboration. And you've alluded to communication already. What does that actually look like you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I think it starts at the very beginning. One, you have to communicate the expectations. Right. What's the end goal? What What does everybody want to go ahead and achieve? Then you need to talk about what are the obstacles that, that may prevent us from, to, from getting to that goal? And then, okay, how are we going to problem solve? How are we going to overcome that? And, and some of the communication is going to kind of be ad hoc, but I think it's also important to kind of standardize some of the communication because we all have bosses. We all have stakeholders, we all have people that we report to, and we don't want to go ahead and be communicating with them just constantly. So you might go ahead and set up, you know, periodic meetings, whether it's once a day, once a week, once a month, whatever works best for both parties, and say, okay, that's the timing that we're going to do standard communication to them. And then the team itself can go ahead and have the ad hoc communication. But they may also create some standardized communication where, hey, every morning, we're gonna have a 15 minute Stand up meeting, and we're going to say this is what we're going to try and get get done today. It may be you know at the end of the day we say okay we're going to these are the obstacles we hit, 
And how do we think we're going to overcome them tomorrow? So again, I think there's a mix between ad hoc and standard communication, but it's got to be transparent. It's got to be ongoing. It's got to be, you know, it's got to happen when necessary. You can't just put problems off and expect them to go away. Love that. Very simple yet effective. It's got to be transparent. One of the things I've discovered in when we attempted to collaborate uh, before, even before the book, uh, was uh, how do you effectively, uh, you know, communicate and be transparent even when things are not going so well? Because it's easy when things are going so well, you know, to communicate that. Uh, but, you know, you've hit the nail right on the top there, but you've got to uh, be transparent in all cases. Uh, you've got to have those communication, make sure that people understand what is the end goal? How are you going to get there? Uh, and when you do that, people understand their part and you understand your part and everybody plays uh, along. I've discovered something uh, here, Chuck, that when people know what is expected of them, uh, and they know the end goal, it's amazing the level of commitment that they will put into something as well. Absolutely. I mean, we, my wife and I, we put in a pool a couple of years ago during the COVID pandemic. So I mean, we sat down with the contract. We said, go ahead and help us set our expectations. I mean, yes, we know at the end of it, we want to have a, a pool to swim in for us, our grandkids, our kids. But, you know, how are we going to go ahead and get there? And he says, well, after I start turning dirt, it's about a six-week process. But he says, hang on, we're not going to go ahead and be able to turn dirt for a couple of months because everybody wants a swimming pool, you know, now that everybody's staying home far more. So that's not unreasonable. So we expected that, and he did, he started about two months later, and we expected you know, a couple months after that because, again, we know weather events can happen and, del and delays and stuff like that. But what ended up happening is it took 21 months after he turned dirt. So, I mean, it, it just, it was such a shock to us. And what really was is, you know, he lost a lot of his subcontractors during that time, but he didn't communicate. So again, the customer, me, you know, we had these expectations that were set between the two of us. And then we were always calling and we were always bothering him. It would have been a great way to resolve that issue. If he had said, okay, look, we, we understand COVID, it's kind of a new experience for all of us. So, you know, I'll at least call you once a week or I'll shoot you an email once a week, letting you know the problems that we're encountering and how we're going to go ahead and overcome them. Now, it may take a little bit longer. And I think had he done that, he would have been able to manage the expectations throughout the project and not had the frustration on my wife and my part as the customers. So I think, you know, one of the, the things that we talked about now, transparent communication and collaboration, but you have to go ahead and keep that communication going during the rough patches, as well as during, you know, when everything runs smooth. And just be honest about it. Yeah, yeah. And an average uh, business person would understand that things sometimes goes wrong because uh, nobody can run a business without going through ups and downs. So they understand that, oh, okay, that may not be the case. Uh, things are not in the right place. And they will give you a bit of grace you know, during that time. But if you don't communicate uh, or if you find it difficult, then find somebody else who can communicate on your behalf uh, so that you, uh, not, uh, you don't fall uh, short uh, on your expectations there. One of the things uh, that you and I uh, talked about earlier on is about the barriers to creating an effective uh, collaboration. In your experience, Chuck, uh, what are those? I mean, there's so many. I, you know, it can be people with different agendas. You know, they're looking to go ahead, you know, and get the glory from a project. Uh, it could be that, hey, they, they want the status quo to, to, to remain intact for some reason. Well, you know, you're being asked to go ahead and change the status quo. So I think you have to go ahead and understand where people are coming from, their agendas. Could be an educational difference. Um, I, I know that I've been in situations where, you know, my language kind of freaks some people out. They're like, you're using $20 words instead of $5 words. It's okay. <laughs> I, I can make that adjustment, but I needed that feedback. And they were just being honest. They weren't trying to be hurtful. I didn't take it as they were trying to be hurtful. But again, I mean, having that communication goes ahead and lends itself to having much better um, collaboration. When I took over uh, one of the plants that, that I was over, I walked in and I sat down, had a meeting with all the employees. I said, 
And it was a, a, a very heavy, very muscular. People were working eight, 10 hours a day, but you know, they were, they were, it was a very physically demanding job. Yeah. And when I walked in, I said, Hey guys, I want to learn it, but I know I'll never know it to the level that you do, but I don't want you just for your muscles. That's not what, that's not why you're here. I need you for your brains. And they're shocked. They said, Chuck, what do you mean? We've never been told that we've been told we don't want your brains. We just want your muscle. I said, nobody will ever know how to do that job better than you. I said, yeah, you can go out you can show me. I'll spend a couple of hours. I'll get the idea of the process, but I'll never fully understand it. And ultimately we're going to want to improve the process for you because one, I, I don't want to wear you out. I, I don't want you to go home so tired and exhausted that, you know, you don't, you can't have a family life. And we're going to have to make improvements. We're going to have to find ways to cut costs. I'm not saying cut pay, but cut costs, eliminate waste. And the only way I can go ahead and do that is by working with you, because the person who knows the job the best is the person who does the job day to day, every day, multiple hours. And their minds were blown. And I think, you know, we built some great collaboration right there in just that conversation. And then as time went on, they saw that, I walked the talk. You know, I would go walk around and I would ask them, hey, is there a way we can go ahead and improve this? Ultimately, after a, a number of years, we started buying equipment that would self-load sheet supply wood for them so they wouldn't have to pick it up. So now all they had to go ahead and do is pick up the, the cut parts, which of course were going to weigh much less, which were going to be much smaller, which allowed them to go ahead and work throughout the day and not be nearly as exhausted when they went home at night. Yeah. Amazing. You've touched on a great aspect of uh, you know, uh, education, you know, difference in agenda, uh, you know, edu you know, life experience and all that. You know, when a business owner like you and I understand that you are coming together, working with people with all these things, you know, you are in a better position to handle them rather than to be surprised by it. Now, how do you handle different agendas when it comes to collaboration or collaborating with anybody else? Well, in the perfect world, we'd all just go ahead and, you know, kind of like a NASCAR or a Formula One driver, we'd show all of our agendas right there on our suit and everybody would know exactly what they are. Unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. So, I mean, sometimes you, you kind of have to see behavior. You have to see where somebody's fighting something um, or you may go ahead and see it on their facial expressions and then, you know, kind of suss it out from them. Sometimes it has to be done on a one-on-one -on -one because they don't want everybody on the team or everybody in the organization knowing all of their business. But on the other hand, you know, you still need to go ahead and find it out. So it may be having some conversations. Um, it may be saying, hey, let's go to lunch and, and find out so I can better understand where you're coming from and, you know, what path you see forward to getting to our destination. Because again, it's not that my path is right or their path is right. It's, okay, let me understand the intricacies of their path and what they see on how to get there because they may have some great valuable insights that I don't have and I'm blindsided by and it'll hurt the project later on. So, you know, have those conversations and sometimes it has to be one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes, you know, it can be done in a group that people will say, hey, you know, I, I really have a problem with this. Okay, so how are we going to address that? Amazing. One of the things I found that works uh, for me, especially when we were working on the book, is uh, being very clear from the get going of the expectation and the goal. What is it that we are trying to do and agree on some basic fundamental ways of operating or engagement, so to speak, uh, and really keep talking about that and keep uh, talking about the vision and the people that have put a different agenda from what the end goal they may slightly you know, move back, uh, but the people that truly believe in where you are going and what you want to do, they begin to use their creative mind to work towards that. It is amazing what happens, but a constant, clear communication uh, seems to solve some of the, some of the problems alongside the one-to-ones uh, that you have mentioned here for sure. Uh, we wanna dive deep to talk about the mistakes you have seen a lot of people, especially business owners, trying to collaborate with others and making mistakes. Sometimes uh, they don't even realize that they're making a mistake, you know, shooting themselves in the foot. In your opinion, Chuck, what are some of the mistakes people make 
when they are trying to collaborate with others? Well, I mean, I, many of the mistakes I've made, I mean, I was not always the most open to asking for help. You know, hey, I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and learn the process. I'm going to learn what I can. I'm going to go ahead and do it. But as I became more self-aware, as I started to understand my limits a little bit better, I could much better understand that I'm never going to be the expert in everything. I need to go ahead and reach out to those experts. You know, I'm great in operations, but accounting is not my forte. And I, I mean, I learned that early on. So, I mean, that was something I could always reach out to our controller or to an accountant to go ahead and help me on. So, I mean, those were kind of, that was an obvious one, but there were other ones that, you know, aren't quite as obvious. And you you have to kind of go ahead and, and sometimes trip, sometimes stumble and fall. The neat thing is I was always in an environment that generally somebody else was there to help pick me up, to say, hey, okay, you made a mistake. It's not the end of the world. What did we learn from this? And I think part of that is doing what I call an after action review or a debrief. When you do make a mistake, what do we learn from it? What went right? What went wrong? And what are we going to go ahead and do different as we move forward? And as we start to have those conversations and we start to go ahead and allow people to make mistakes then and, and learn from those mistakes, then we start to go ahead and really start to come together because we're willing to go ahead and show our flaws and we're human. We all have certain flaws, and sometimes that's part of the glue that, that starts to bring us together is that, hey, I'm not going to be perfect here. I'm not expecting you to be perfect here. So how do we go ahead and work together and get rid of some of the imperfections on both of our sides to get closer to perfect or to get closer to that perfection that we're striving for? Yeah, amazing. Uh, love that indeed. Uh, thank you, Chuck, for sharing the, those thoughts. We are coming toward the end of our time here together, uh, Chuck. But uh, for anybody who is looking to, to taking this whole aspect of collaborating very seriously, knowing what you know now, uh, you know, from all these years of doing it, what will be the best way to engage and you know, and maybe what will be the best mindset to go into collaboration with? Now, that's two questions right there, isn't it? <laughs> well, I think going with an open mind. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. That's right. And you'd be surprised what others know. And ask, ask questions. I mean, one of the things that I had heard, um, one of the best qualities of any leader is curiosity. Ask the questions. Don't be afraid to even look dumb in some cases. But ask the questions, be curious, investigate. You'll find better ways to do things. I think, I think we, that same curiosity will go ahead and lead to other people who are like-minded who also want to collaborate. Hey, you know, this isn't, doesn't seem to be looking right or it doesn't seem to be working right. You know, what are your thoughts? All of a sudden, you'll find so many more people say, well, you're right. I agree. I've been thinking about this for years, and I've kind of had this idea in my back pocket, but I've never felt comfortable providing it. So I think curiosity and just, just an open willingness to have those conversations. Yes, amazing, amazing. Really, curiosity is the hallmark of great leaders. You know, if you can ask questions, right questions, and the quality of question to decide the quality of answers you get and work on your question that you ask, you become a great collaborator and seek to serve rather than to be the person who is being served all the time. I love that uh, indeed. Chuck, I know you wrote a great book there that is on Amazon, which has become an international bestseller, uh, which is Hope is Not a Business Strategy, uh, which, you know, there's a lot of people talking about that. Uh, talk to us about that very briefly before we end here. Uh, it's a book that I wrote. Uh, it's about my wife and I's journey over the last five years dealing with contractors, because I suspected Rather than talking about corporate America or talking about the military where some people might not, not might not understand or might not go ahead and, and be able to relate, I want to talk about contractors, whether it's the plumber who comes in to work on your pipes or unstop your toilet or the HVAC person who comes in to make sure your heat's working or your air conditioning's working. Um, so we took uh, kind of the last five, 10 years of the different issues that we'd seen. Some of them were phenomenal. We had we had contractors who'd come in and they put little booties on over their, their boots, making sure they weren't tracking outside dirt and mud into our house. My wife loved it. 
<laughs> so, I mean, we, we don't talk about just the bad things. We talk about also a lot of the good things sure. in there. Um, and and I, I wrote the book to go ahead and help small or mid-sized businesses. But I think it also applies to, you know, a department head of a corporation. How can they go ahead and run that department as it's their business? Because ultimately it is and go ahead, do better, connect to the customer, set expectations, better communicate, collaborate, and really go ahead and be a success, not just for themselves, but for their whole team. That's right. That's right. Incredible. Well, if you want to know how to do this, there's a book there that you can find on Amazon, even in here in the UK. I checked it out earlier on. Uh, it is uh, called Hope is Not a Business Strategy. Uh, you will be able to find that it's written by uh, Charles here uh, for sure. And if you've got uh, time, leave some reviews on there. Uh, some ratings will be awesome as well. Well, Jack, it's been great having you on the show and uh, listening to some of your uh, ideas there. That's brilliant. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Indeed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be on the show, you know where to go. Just uh, click the link below or just apply on our website, Your Kai Business Show, and we'll be able to uh, have you here on the show. But most importantly, uh, if you have had something today that you feel connected with, something that you can apply in your business, uh, can I encourage you to just make it happen? I always say to people, never leave a place of discovering a new idea without scheduling when you're going to implement that. I learned that from Tony Robbins, I think, uh, several years ago. So I want you to encourage you to, to do the same thing. If you like one thing that Chuck has said here, or what is something that I've said, you know, plan to implement it. Is it tomorrow, next week, or even next year? Just put it and then try it and see what works. And if it works so well, let Chuck know. By the way, Chuck, where can people find you? Best place to go ahead and get in contact is on my website, 13ten.com. Excellent. Are you on social media at all? I am generally on LinkedIn. You can find me under Chuck Kenne Bush or 1310. Excellent. Awesome. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead, connect with Chuck, and would love to hear your success story at some point. And until next time, live well, live with passion. Know that the best is truly yet to come. Thanks again, Chuck. Uh, talk to you soon. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Thank you for tuning in to your Kai Business Show. We hope you have enjoyed today's episode and have gained valuable insights and inspiration from our amazing guest. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review to help us spread the word. Also, be sure to check out our Leadership Outmate Success Mastermind program which is designed to help you and leaders in our community to do great things and support each other along their leadership journey. Until next time, live well, live with passion, know that the best is truly yet to come.